It's 4 o'clock on Tuesday, and that means it's time for another exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. Yahoo! <laughs> Hello, you guys. Today, we're going to talk about how to use moods and emotions to better tiled, title your instrumental cues. But before that, let's say hello to the folks in the chat room. Hello, Martin Gravel, Reine Bear, Nancy Clell, Ewart Williams, John Pearson, Marion Laird, Jesse J. Peck, Dave Friedland, Andre Stepanian, Motion, Music to Motion, uh, Glenn Letts, Bob Gunnerfeld, Chris Anderson, Marion Laird, eh, I think I'm repeating some here, Kip Johnson, Jan Wylidge, Pat Wara, Scott Hansen, hello Scott, welcome back, Darren Fletcher, Greg Carosa, Ewart Williams, if I didn't say that already, uh, uh, John Dancy, I'm trying to pick out the people I haven't said hello to, Patricia Julian, Dean Turner, Michael Bruce Miller, anyway, hello you guys. Good to be with you on this fine Tuesday afternoon here. Um, I like the fact that it's staying lighter out later these days. Uh, what did I want to tell you about? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, you know how uh, we have a lot of critters creeping around our yard? Uh, had a gopher attack the other day. A uh, big old mound in the backyard when I went out there, but so far it hasn't been relocated, but I'm sure he will sooner or later. Um, but two nights ago, I went out on our back patio probably around 9 o'clock to make sure that I'd actually turn the gas off on the grill because I'll leave the gas on like low for a half an hour after I cook just to burn all the crud off of the, the grate. And I opened up the back door and the lights went on out back and I saw something in my periphery and I looked to my left and uh, I saw what I thought was a cat. Then I realized it was a really big cat. And then it kind of loped its way back, you know, to the back side of the yard where there's a hill. And it stopped and turned around and looked at me and I realized it had no tail, a very short tail, and it had a big old head. It was a bobcat in our backyard. <laughs> a bobcat. Can't say uh, we've ever had a bobcat before, although there are a fair number of bobcat sightings around the neighborhood. Um, also, how about yesterday's show for those of you who joined us with, uh, with Sean Hurwitz, man. Uh, that guy is so logical and practical and has his act so well together. I, I thought he was a great guest and uh, hope you guys that, that saw it enjoyed it as well. Yep, it was a bobcat. Cass McKenty's giving a plus one. I'm guessing you get a lot of them where you live. Um, are they dangerous? I mean, I, I wouldn't want to try and pet one, but I, I would imagine that they generally don't like run at you and try and attack, that they run from you. Mountain lions, not so much. Um, was my bobcat wearing a trench coat? No. <laughs> I don't understand that, Scott, and I'm afraid to ask. <laughs> Sean, be cool. Yes, Sean, definitely cool. Oh, bobcat Goldway, that bobcat. <laughs> uh, Jim Stamper, subscribe to Sean's channel. Yay. They're ferocious? Bobcats are ferocious? Really? I didn't know that. Well, hopefully the bobcat, I, I think it's about that time of year that if that coyote that was visiting last year is going to come back. Do you realize we've been doing taxi uh, quarantini happy hours now for almost a year? I think that, I want to say it was March 25th that the staff and I went remote <laughs> for two weeks to <laughs> flatten the curve. <laughs> Bobcat is on the menu tonight. Yeah, I hear Bobcat. Oh, Sean Hurwitz is in the room. <laughs> Yo, Hurwitz, how are you, man? Um, yeah, I hear Bobcat sausage is delicious, but you have to put um, either put it in marinade in a quart Ziploc the night before. <laughs> <laughs> or put a lot of bobcat rub on it. <laughs> bobcat not on the menu. <laughs> Sean, uh, 
<laughs> he owns a pizza restaurant uh, or an Italian family style restaurant, I should say, in Cleveland. Um, the U.S. is opening soon. I'll believe it when I see it. Um, <laughs> Scott Hansen, nothing I say is real. So we have learned over the years, Scott. Yeah, anyway, <clears throat> do you believe it's been like a year that we've been doing this? Um, I was at the office on Monday, I think, and looking at my desk from the visitor side of the desk and thinking, wow, when I go back there and start doing taxi TVs from there again, the, the background's going to be very boring. I won't have the halo. I uh, won't have the depth of field. Won't have cardboard taped up on the little windows. <laughs> have you ever shown you guys that? Start doing that during the rally because the light behind me was messing up the focus. So uh, I had to cut out some corrugated cardboard in every... Uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, I have to tape it up and then take it down. Wow, a year of you not being on the road. Is Trish happy about that, Sean, or not so happy? <laughs> was it hard getting adjusted to being home all the time, or was it pretty much the same old thing? Yeah, Martin, I've actually thought, I actually had that thought the other day, doing a green screen and taking a photo of this. Hey, Lamar, how are you? Wow, it's the most you've ever been together in 10 years. So again, does Trish like that or <laughs> not so much? Are you a pain in the ass around the house? Um, and who does the cooking? She's happy with it. Wow, cool. <laughs> oh, man. Veal Parmesan for dinner tonight. Is your restaurant opened up or is it just carryouts? Uh, are, are you guys doing outdoor? It's too cold to do outdoor dining in Cleveland, right? Yeah, we both cook as well at our house too, but I, I tend to do the, the dinners Monday through Thursday. Actually, Sunday. Sunday night I make a big dinner usually. And then Monday through Thursday, I cook Friday night dinner. Deb always does the uh, thing. Ooh, Carroza's is doing the uh, tenderloin, the pork tenderloin sandwiches for dinner tonight. Make sure you hammer it out super thin. I mean, really thin, so it almost tears. What loudness lofts do I recommend for taxi submissions? I don't know enough about that, frankly, because I didn't live in the digital world back in the day. Um, but I'm sure if you ask that question on the forum or even people here in the chat room will answer it for you. I'm a VU meter kind of guy. Um, I, I love, I don't know why, but I have a love affair with VU meters tipping into the red. I just, things sound better up there for me. Soaking in buttermilk. Oh my God, not kosher at your house. <laughs> as loud as you'd like. <laughs> I love it. All right, so... Um, I actually prepared a little bit for today's informal gathering. Uh, I'm stealing liberally today from Steve Barden's incredibly comprehensive and wonderful book, Writing Production Music for TV, The Road to Success by Steve Barden. Hello, Edmund. So remember uh, last week, right? We were talking about titling cues, and uh, I think that reflexively people we're titling cues by the genre. We were trying to, uh, I mean, they weren't saying, you know, like, um, I don't know, orchestral string quartet number one, maybe not that much by genre. Um, but uh, what's the, I'm trying to think of the right word for this. 
I hypothesized, <clears throat> excuse me, I hypothesized that if I were an editor working on a reality show and I had a beat that I wanted to drop music into and I was looking at the bucket of music that I would want to see stuff that inferred or implied the mood. So I was looking at Appendix B in Barden's book and saw he's got a great list of moods here. It's really, really, really comprehensive. The subcategories are happy slash positive, sad, bad, negative, <clears throat> neutral. Let's see what else we've got there. And neutral. Okay, so happy, sad, and neutral. So just bouncing around. Um, let's take optimistic. So let's say you had a light acoustic track. You could call it something like, um, you could actually say optimism, optimism reigns, you know, uh, R-E-I-G-N-S. Uh, if I were an editor and I saw a track titled that, I'd go, oh, that's an optimistic sounding track. That's what I need. How about Jolly? Um, let's think of Jolly, uh, and not Santa Claus, it's too easy, too on the nose, but let's think of Surf Rock. So what if you had a really fun scene with guys surfing, just cracking up out there? You could call it, you know, like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm stumped. <laughs> um... Ooh, sirens. Uh, I don't know, jolly waves or something like that. Um, enchanted, that's a good one. You know, you could drop that word, enchanted, enchantment, uh, right into a title. Um, blissful, um, an, you know, a light acoustic track, blissful day, blissful sunset, blissful morning. Um, Bubbly, there's a great word. Could have a track, anything that, man, oh man, that could be like bubbly dramedy, um, bubbly anything. If the word bubbly is in there, you automatically have an idea of the ballpark it's going to be in. Um, celestial, celestial space, celestial sky, um, celestial vibes. Um, let's see determined how about determination nation um freewheeling that's a good one slapstick stick that in the title you know what it is um playful Motivational, you could truncate that to, you know, uh, motivated, gated, <laughs> not my best title ever. Hopeful, man, hopeful is such a great word. Um, hopeful, optimistic, I mean, those are things that are so easily used in commercials. You know, those pharmaceutical commercials uh, almost always have light, hopeful, optimistic music in them. So there you go. Soaring, sparkling, um, summery, sweet, thankful, triumphant. That's a great one. Um, whimsical. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm going to go with the uh, light acoustic track here just because I'm kind of stuck on that at the moment. But uh, what if you had, you know, like whimsical winds, whimsical wheels, um, whimsical day, anything with the word whimsical, you know what it's going to sound like. Wondrous, that's a great one. Yellow without the W, I'm going to have to send a letter to the editor on that one because I have, like yellow or yellow and they just forgot the W? I don't know, is, is yellow a mood? Not so sure.
All right, let's look under sad, bad, and negative. Ooh, abrasive, aggressive, and good adjectives. I'm not sure that they work that well on title titles. Angry, angry birds, you know. Uh, I don't know if you get sued for copyright infringement on that one, but... And, you know, what if you had uh, an angry sounding metal track and called it Angry Anvil? Anguished, anxious, apprehensive. Um, brooding, confused. Creepy, there's a really good one. Um, music to Motion remembers the group Yellow. I remember the name, but I don't remember anything. No, music to motion. Yellow is not the color of a school bus. Yellow is the color of a taxi. Try doing that backwards sometimes. That was hard to do. <laughs> On LSD, yellow is a mood. I wouldn't know. Um, I can tell you that it's a lot brighter than it normally is, though. Um, defeated. Dangerous. Dirty, ooh. Disturbing, doubtful. Down in doubtful. I mean, you know what that cue is gonna sound like. Um, foreboding, call it a, a title for forever foreboding. Frantic, freaky. Greasy, my favorite word. I love the word greasy in the context of like blues guitar. Greasy blues guitar. Awesome. Um, hectic. Hopeless. I mean, you could use the word hopeless in titles all day long. My favorite reference, you know, the family after a funeral, either back at the house or in the limo going back to the house. Um, or hopeless in other contexts, but just hopeless, hurt. Jealous, jumpy, longing, melancholic. It sounds like something a baby gets. <laughs> Sad and farting and burping a lot. Uh, mournful. That's a good one. Nasty. Anyway, you know what? I don't make anything from this recommendation, uh, but buy the buy this book. I, just the appendices in this book are worth the twenty nine bucks that the book costs. So there you go. Highly recommend it. Oh, you know what? I should have looked at neutral. I want to see what is under the neutral category. Um, under neutral, we have accepting, acoustic, adventurous, ambient, um, atmospheric. That's a good one. Banal. I never know exactly what that means. Um, bouncy? I don't know. I, I wouldn't agree with Steve that bouncy is neutral. I think bouncy implies fun. Bouncy. Um, <laughs> butch? Is butch a mood? I don't know. I'm probably going to get canceled for even asking that question. <laughs> Uh, climactic. I can think of the type of film that might be in. Um, dreamy. Edgy. Erotic. <laughs> exotic. Folksy. Free. Frisky. There's a good word for you. Frisky. Um... Yeah, you know, you could have a, a dramedy piece that would be good in one of those shows where they have like a bucket full of puppies that they dump on the floor and they all like bite each other's tails. You could call it like Frisky Puppy. <laughs> there you go. You know it, exactly what you're going to get when you see a cue named Frisky Puppy or Puppies. Um, hardcore. That sounds like a sub that would be available. Uh, at a certain Italian restaurant <laughs> in Cincinnati, or in Cleveland, sorry. Jerky. 
I don't know that this is appropriate for the, what I'm trying to teach you today, but uh, how about a dramedy cue called Turkey Jerky? <laughs> Here's a word I've never heard before, and I've got a reasonably good vocabulary, luch, L-U-C-H. Does anybody know what luch means? Let's find out. Definition of the word luch. I don't find it spelled that way. Well, apparently we have much to much to learn about. That. All right, uh, a meal you eat at noon, right without the end. Breakfast, lunch, and dinners. <laughs> oh man, I love hanging out with you guys. Um, Here's another word I've never heard. Roising. I think he, maybe it's a typo. R-O-U-I-S-I-N-G. Roising. Um, rustic. That might be good for something like uh, a banjo, acoustic guitar, like an Americana thing. Call it like, you know, rustic vibe or rustic cabin. Schmaltzy. Good dramedy cue word. Um, do you guys actually know what schmaltz is? I'm convinced that schmaltz killed my grandparents. And I'm not kidding. I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> schmaltz. Who knows what schmaltz is? Sean, are you still in the room? You'll know what schmaltz is. It has to be a telepo. <laughs> Chicken fat. Yep, absolutely. So, Jewish people from the old country, I, I would imagine that um, maybe people that weren't Jewish from the old country would eat schmaltz. They would take chicken fat, the drippings, when they would make chicken, and they would run it through a strainer to get all the particulate matter out of there, maybe. I don't know. Um, and my grandparents, I, I kid you not when I tell you that my grandfather, and he was from the old country, he was from, well, it depended if it was Russia or it was Russia or the Ukraine, I don't know, it kind of depended which war just happened and where the borders were at the time. But he would take schmaltz, like two tablespoons of chicken fat, and use a knife and smear it on, he would take a whole onion about this big, about the size of an apple. He would peel it, then cut it in half, and then take schmaltz and smear it on that onion and then bite into it like an apple. And he could eat an entire raw onion like that. I would die of gas pains if I did that. Um, schmaltz is awesome on matzah. It is, but it, it's like the unhealthiest thing you could eat. And my grandparents used to put it on everything. Uh, oddly enough, my grandfather, I think, passed away when he was 76. <clears throat> my grandmother lived till 97, so maybe he was the bigger schmaltz eater in the family. All right, now this is a test for all you guys to see how good your Yiddish is. Does anybody know what gribbiness is? <laughs> Today's show by Rabbi Lasko is, let's play an episode of Who's a Jew? <laughs> Uh, no, my grandfather wasn't unmarried. <laughs> Although I remember whenever my grandparents got into an argument, they would always yell at each other in Yiddish so that the kids wouldn't understand. <laughs> Gribbonus. Today's password is Gribbonus. Yep, 
Carosa must be looking it up because I know <laughs> I'm guessing Carosa is not a Jewish name. <laughs> Fried chicken skins and onions. Yep. It, it, too bad. I guess you could add a bunch of preservatives to it and put it in a bag and sell it at 7-Eleven. <laughs> oh, man. Gryffindorf. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I'll take strange words for 800, please, Alex. Mondel bread. I know what Mondel bread is, but I didn't know until I moved. I grew up in a little farm town in Illinois. There weren't very many Jewish families there. So it wasn't until I went to Miami and then eventually, after 10 years in South Florida, moved to New York and New Jersey that I learned what Mondel bread. Mondel bread is, it's hard. It's like this hard, dry bread that, um, do I have something to draw on today? Let's see. It's time for Rabbi Lasko's art class. Mondel bread. This is a side view of Mondel bread. Uh, and it's usually about three or four inches across, about three quarters of an inch high. Uh, can have anything from like dates or raisins to pistachios in there. Uh, not quite like Melba toast. It's more dense. Yes, all this is in Stephen <laughs> Bar Steve Barton's book. Glad you brought that up. Hi, Nancy. Uh, Carosa Steve. Like biscotti, there you go. Very much like biscotti. It does contain almonds are often in model bread. Uh, it's really dry. You have to have a serious case of the munchies or be from the old country before you will eat model bread. Um, oh my gosh, Scott Hansen, uh, Gedimpta Flunken. <laughs> that was beyond me. Uh, Melba toast is airier, uh, but biscotti, I mean, Mondel bread literally is like a dentist's best friend. Uh, it, it's so hard that when you bite into it, you're liable to crack a crown or just break off a tooth. Um, Mondel is almond in Danish. Well, there you go. So maybe Mondel bread originally only had almonds in it. But if you go to a place like Zabar's, which is a pretty famous uh, like deli uh, on the Upper West Side of, of Manhattan, uh, they've got like 10 different kinds of Mondel bread. Used to be one of my favorite things to do when I lived in New York was if I didn't have my kids for the weekend, wake up on a Saturday morning and go to Zabar's and get like a bagel with everything on it. And man, they put so much like lox and cream cheese on a bagel that when you bit into it, it just like spewed out of the sides. Um, and just buy myself little like, uh, you know, like some Kalamata olives and a kosher dill pickle, like a really crunchy um, green pickle. Um, can't think of what else. Anyway, I'd spend like $50 on all these little Jewish delicacies and then go over to Central Park with my Walkman um, and spread out a towel or a blanket on the Great Lawn and just hang out by myself listening to music, nibbling on stuff from Zabar's all afternoon. It was such a great way to spend a Saturday. <laughs> Douglas Fuqua, hello Douglas, uh, burned a pizza. <laughs> made a great frisbee nearly killed a neighbor's cat better hope liz ain't watching the show right now she'll come and find you uh did i eat milts nope sounds like a good name for like jewish breath mints honey pass the milts <laughs> john dancy you looked at zabar's sign in nyc and you gained 20 pounds went to school there three years yeah zabar's not uh, not healthy or dietetic in any way, shape, or form, but man, was it good. You can order stuff um, on the internet, get it delivered from uh, Zabar's. <laughs> Try smearing your model bread with schmaltz. <laughs> uh, New York pizza. Nothing better. I, I lived in Illinois for many years. Um, uh, you know, Chicago pizza, I don't get it. I just don't get it. It's okay. 
pizza actually out in the boonies in Illinois, in a little farm town I grew up in. Um, pizza was really, really good. The Chicago deep dish stuff, I don't like, but that's personal preference. New York City pizza. You can go to the most low rent, like tiny little hole in the wall pizza place almost anywhere in New York. The dumpier it looks, the better the pizza will be. And just go in there and get a slice. And I remember I used to have a place on the Upper West Side where I could get a slice for 75 cents. That was just every bite was a delight. It was so good that you could eat just plain cheese pizza. And it was like amazing. Why do you feel hungry? <laughs> great Philly and uh, great pizza in Philly. Good to know. Yeah, they say it's the water in New York. I don't know. Uh, the tap water in New York actually tastes good. I would be afraid to know how many like decomposed bodies are in there because I think they get the water from the East River. <laughs> kishka. I think we actually have a frozen kishka in the freezer right now. Ooh, <laughs> a pastrami sandwich from Cat's Deli. Remember the stage delicatessen? I don't know how we got on this subject, but... What the hell? Here's what we haven't covered in a year, right? Uh, stage Deli in New York. Ottawa, Illinois is one country away from the birthplace, or one county away from the birthplace of Ronald Reagan. That's right. And it's also the home. I think it's, I want to say Washington Park. I can't remember. There was, uh, my parents owned a, a little store, a small department store on the main street in Ottawa called Famous Department Store. And about a block away was like the town square park. And uh, there was a big boulder that I believe is still there that had a plaque on it. it was the site of the original Lincoln-Douglas debate. Um, the very first Lincoln-Douglas debate. So that was our claim to fame there. Um, Also, it was the home of W.D. Boyce, the founder of the Boy Scouts, who is now probably turning over in his grave with all the uh, stuff that's gone on there with abusing Boy Scouts. How would you like to earn your... Uh, what, I, I was one. I can't even remember what it was. Uh, how would you like to earn your Eagle Scout badge uh, in a private room? No, thank you. Um Wow, Scott, you were voted best pizza in Cleveland a few years ago. <laughs> not, not that high of a bar, but I won. <laughs> That's funny. Someday, I'm not kidding. You know I'm not kidding about this, Scott. Someday, I am going to show up at like, you know, 1.30 in the afternoon at your restaurant and go, okay, dude, I hope your internet connection is good because we're going to do a live episode of Taxi TV from the kitchen at Scott's restaurant. Yeah, Jerry's Deli, um, you know what? My personal opinion is Jerry's Deli is more of a thing than it is the food. The food's okay. You know, like go there and get matzo ball soup. It's pretty good. Portions are big. Um, I think one of them closed down. I think that the one on Ventura Boulevard in Encino, I think that one closed down. I think that the other one is still open, but I could be wrong. Yeah, the Boy Scouts now have Girl Eagle Scouts from admitting girls into Cub Scouts several years ago. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, the whole gender thing, I don't want to go all political on that, but um, I don't see why Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts couldn't go to the same things. Although, you know, and, and again, I guess we're getting into gender bias maybe, but, you know, assuming that Girl Scouts want to sew things and learn how to cook and boy scouts want to learn how to build campfires i don't know i've got to believe that there's some sort of neutral ground in there that all kids could benefit from i enjoyed the cub scouts i enjoyed the boy scouts um had many fond memories we'll get that taxi cooking show <laughs> i actually thought about that about two hours ago before i picked up steve barden's book i was thinking what can i do today um I, I just don't, I don't know, a cooking show? 
I will tell you something I did learn in Boy Scouts that has stayed with me my entire life. Uh, do you guys know what Bisquick is? Um, you know, it's like flour. I don't know what else is in there, but you buy it in a, the transgender scouts. <laughs> oh my gosh. Stop right there, Scott. <laughs> Actually, I saw something about the whole transgender thing on TV the other night that blew my mind. Um, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's inappropriate. If it's on mainstream news, I guess we could talk about it here. Um, but I can't cast my vote either way. I can only cast my vote as to it was out there and I couldn't believe my ears. Uh, anyway, Bisquick. Ooh, Marion, you've got Bisquick in the fridge. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, in Boy Scouts, every year we used to do a wintertime hike. It was like a five or 10 mile hike to this deserted cabin out in the middle of the woods somewhere in the state of Illinois. Um, and I remember it being freezing cold with like foot high snow and your feet were like, just, you couldn't even feel your toes by the time we got there, but we would get there and we'd build a huge bonfire outside of the cabin and take Bisquick, mix it with water and make a sticky dough out of it. And then take tin foil, usually the heavy duty variety of tin foil, and then take a little butter or margarine and smear it around on the tin foil, then make a thing about the size of a softball out of the Bisquick dough, wrap it up tight in the tin foil, and then throw it into the open coals of the bonfire. And when you see it start to expand and kind of rip the tin foil apart a little bit, pull it out and eat it. And it's a little hard and crunchy and smoky flavored on the outside and moist and delicious on the inside. Um, so I actually taught that recipe to my mom. I don't think it took much, much education, actually. And we made these things a lot of times on Sunday mornings for breakfast. We called them bombers because you ate one. You felt like somebody dropped a belly bomber on you. But really, really, really good. You can make it in the oven. You don't even need to wrap it in the tinfoil. Just plop it on a, you know, like a, a lightly greased cookie sheet. Just take a, a hunk. In the oven, it works better if you use a chunk that's about the size of an orange and just throw it on there, put the oven on 350 when it turns golden brown, pull it out, let it cool down for a minute, break it apart, smear some butter on it. You will be happy. You will also be fat. Ooh, Dutch oven peach cobbler with Bisquick. That sounds really good. Yes, I've had waffles made with Bisquick. You're right, works really well on that. Well, today's show is going to be a cooking show at Taxi. I've never made a homemade chicken pot pie. My wife has made them. She makes them with, um, oh, I forgot, that super thin, like, phyllo dough, I think, that you buy in the grocery store. It comes in sheets and it's frozen. Then you thaw it out and roll them out. And she sticks it in, like, a little thing um it's time for show and tell aren't these cute little la crusade whatever they're good for like desserts and stuff but take one of these guys, line it with um, phyllo dough, then take leftover chicken and some mixed veg frozen mixed vegetables and make whatever, I don't even know how she makes the saucy stuff, and put it in there and then wrap the dough over the top, stick it in the oven, and there you go. Chicken pot pie, a la Debbie. Isn't it funny? Uh, I mean, here we are, almost a year later. What are we talking about? Bisquick. <laughs> are we talking about making music? Hell no. Pie dough recipe I got from America's Text Kitchen. You mean Test Kitchen? <laughs> it uses vodka instead of water. It comes out super flaky. Oh, that makes sense. Wow, Carosi, you're really into cooking. I'm not sure what she uses. Uh, 
She doesn't use cream because our, our kitchen is kosher. We don't mix meat and milk here. Um, so, but I don't think she makes, um, maybe she takes homemade chicken soup and maybe adds like flour to it or cornstarch or something to thicken it up a little bit. Paul Gavin made a goal to submit five tracks to a listing. I'm going to finish it tonight. Well, that's great, Paul, but we're talking about phyllo dough here. <laughs> no, that is good. <laughs> five tracks, um, all instrumentals. <laughs> Hanson loves chicken pot pie, but he doesn't use chicken or pie, just pie. <laughs> uh... Kip Johnson's nephew got his Eagle Scout at the Garden of the Gods National Park in Southern Illinois, in El Dorado. I've never been there. I've been down to, um, where's Southern Illinois University? I can't even remember the name of the town, but it's right like down by Cairo, right at the bottom tip of the state. I've been down there. Um, I also grew up five minutes away, if anybody knows, from Starved Rock State Park and Buffalo Park. We actually had some bison very near uh, my hometown. I use cornstarch all the time. I love making like just beef stir fry, you know, and throw any mushrooms, green peppers, red peppers, um, whatever you've got, little beef, stick it in the wok, add some uh, uh, soy sauce to it, and then finish it off with some watered down cornstarch, a um, little garlic. Mwah. Carbondale, thank you. Wow, you're on your game there, Doug. Yeah, we take a picture of the tenderloins. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll include it in the show on Thursday. If you send it to me Thursday morning, I'll, I'll pop it into a frame here and pop it up so everybody can see what a tenderloin looks like. And make sure not to, when you uh, do the saltines, make sure to pulverize them. Like I put them in the blender. Because it doesn't work as well when it's got, like, chips. You want it to be granular. Music to Motion. Saw the buffalo and or bison. I remember walking up to the fence there, and you go, like, face to face with, like, a thousand pounds of buffalo. And they would just sit there and breathe on you. It was gross smelling. It's like butt face. <laughs> And remember, Carosa, uh, my personal favorite way to have them is on a regular old cheapo hamburger bun um, with yellow mustard. Not as good with like fancy mustard, it's just cheap yellow mustard, drizzle it on there, and then like a couple ringlets of uh, raw onion. Mwah. Michael Bruce Miller, we have bison. Well, great, don't tell anybody that you've got them because they'll probably come and take them away. I can't believe we're talking. <laughs> All we're talking about is food. Pat War is super hungry now, but it it's only it's just after lunchtime, right? You're in Hawaii, Pat, right? What am I drinking today? I'm drinking two things. I'm having iced coffee, which I think I'll take a swig now if you don't mind. I feel so sorry for people that watch the show that have never seen a quarantini before and are expecting an education on music stuff, and they tune into today's episode. <laughs> what the hell are these people talking about? And the other thing I'm drinking is coconut water, which I've actually grown to like. It's better cold, though. Oh, that's right. It's almost 3 o'clock there. Oh, because are you guys on Daylight Savings Time? Aren't you in Hawaii? 
French's yellow mustard. Yep. But you know what? Buy the store brand because it's still a French's yellow mustard in a different bottle and it's like half the price. Bison or veal in your shepherd's pie and you'll never use beef again. Good to know. Um, I had bison tenderloins at a restaurant some years ago. They were amazing. Yeah, they say coconut water is very good for you. A lot of electrolytes. Ah, uh, you guys don't do daylight savings time. Got it. I just saw flights today from Honolulu for like $190 round trip. Couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I normally flights, coach flights are 500, 600 bucks round trip. A cheap yellow mustard commercial from the back of the checker taxi. <laughs> God, I miss my checker taxi. I haven't seen that thing now in a year and a half. There was a place right near my hometown, like, I don't know, 10 minutes outside of downtown Ottawa called Starved Rock State Park. Um, and it was inhabited, I believe, by the Ottawa Indians. I could be wrong about that, but one tribe of Indians, I, I hope I'm remembering this right because I'm remembering it from grade school. That was a very long time ago. But one tribe of Indians got trapped up on this rock um, this, I don't know, probably a hundred feet high or something, um, surrounded, I believe by another tribe, maybe it was the Illini Indians trapped the Ottawa Indians. And I, as the story goes, at least as I remember it from being a kid, um, that the Indians that were trapped on top rather than being captured and clubbed to death by the other Indians and scalped and all that stuff that they just decided to commit suicide by jumping off the rock into the river or something like that. I could be totally wrong about that. I'm sure somebody will correct me very soon. Yeah, I'm not a, a fan of grass-fed beef. Gotta say, I've tried it a few times. Eh. Uh, the taxi is actually in the underground parking of the West End Hotel where we hold the road rally. That's in my contract that they store the car for free. I used to pay like two or three hundred dollars a month to park it down there. And then one year they were like, I could see they're really anxious to get me to sign my contract for two years out. And I said, tell you what, I will do the contract for two years out, but I need free parking. And they gave it to me. So, yay. I think it depends where, what part of the bison you eat. Um, the few times I've had it, though, it's very good. It's less fatty. Um, and I'm sure, you know, that uh, different bison, um, you know, if it's like farm raised, I don't think people, I don't think you're allowed to go out in the wild and, and harvest them anymore. Um, Music to Motion says, I can confirm, I was correct about the Illini and Ottawa Indians. Wow, what a memory I've got. I think I learned that when I was like eight or nine years old. Peoria Indians at Starved Rock. Interesting. Yeah, bison is just less fatty. It's not... I, I've had some bison that I remember, like uh, the tenderloin thingies that were really good. They were very tender, very juicy, and I had them like medium rare. Uh, but I've had bison burgers that were a little like hard and rubbery, but they were also cooked a little longer. They were like medium because people don't like to serve burgers with pink stuff in the middle anymore. Sometimes the childhood history lessons stick with us. They do, but it seems like nobody teaches history anymore. I find that in my 
travels in my lifetime that friends of mine that have grown up uh, in Europe, let's say, um, other parts of the world, that they are generally much better educated on world history. Sometimes even um, they know more about American history than we actually know. Um, but history is, is apparently taught to a higher degree um, in other countries. I remember being on a plane with a former brother-in-law of mine who was from South Africa many years ago, like 35, 40 years ago. And that guy, and he wasn't like a brainiac kind of guy. Um, I don't think he even went to college, frankly. Um, but he knew so much about American history and was just off the charts with European history. I was really blown away. And he said that he found that Americans generally weren't very well educated on our own history, which is very sad. Rocky Mountain oysters. Yeah, I'm not trying those. I'll eat almost anything. I, you know what? I'd probably eat them, frankly. I will eat anything. I've had ostrich. Ostrich, frankly, is wonderful. Um, I think ostrich basically tastes like beef. Uh, I've had ostrich tenderloins, and, and they were slightly pink in the middle and couldn't tell the difference. It, it was as juicy and flavorful as a good cut of beef, um, but not greasy. So next time you run into an ostrich, there you go. Poor Liz is probably crying. She's a vegetarian. Ostriches and kosher. Well, shh. Ostrich should be kosher. It's a bird. I think all fowl is kosher. Not so with fish. Uh, shellfish are not kosher. A fish has to have scales and a dorsal fin in order to qualify as being kosher. Because generally speaking, fish that don't have scales, uh, like catfish or sharks, are um, garbage. You know, they'll eat anything. Um, <laughs> Marion's not telling Deb good. Um, I've had alligator, alligator sausage that was good, really spicy. Not naturally, but it was spiced up a lot. Not all fowl are kosher. Well, there you go. <laughs> I'm never going to find out here because uh, my wife would never eat ostrich. Bottom feeders like shrimp. There you go. Um... Nothing like a tenderloin sandwich. I'm telling you, it's ask anybody who's had tenderloins and burgers, which one would you like for dinner tonight? I would say 98% of those people are going to pick tenderloins. There's just something about them. Are they healthy? No. Are they delicious? Damn right. Owls, eagles, and hoopos? What's a hoopo? Let's discuss sauces. Glad you asked. We've only got seven minutes, but I've got a sauce that you should know about. Okay. We've all either heard about or tried buffalo chicken wings, right? So back in 1981, late 1981, I was leaving South Florida and moving to New York. Um, the people that started the Wings restaurant, uh, the original Buffalo, I think they invented Buffalo Wings in Buffalo, had retired um, and they lived either in or around Pompano Beach, Florida, which is where I lived at the time, and they got tired of being retired. Uh, so they opened up a restaurant called Wings and Things in Pompano Beach. You should Google that sometime. Um, you know, like newspaper for tablecloths kind of place. Everything comes in a little red or yellow plastic basket. The food is wonderful. And so I put on about 15 pounds in a year because it was eating those wings about three or four nights a week. And the day that the moving truck pulled out with our stuff, the last thing I did in the state of Florida was drive over to Wings and Things, walk into the kitchen and said, I can't live without these. I'm moving to New York. Please show me how to make them. And they did. And the secret 
is something you can find in every grocery store in America. Frank's Red Hot Sauce. This is actually the wings version. It's already got the margarine or something mixed in. But you can buy just the straight up regular Frank's Red Hot Sauce. Read the recipe that's on the back of the bottle that is, in fact, the actual real recipe. And it's funny, you go to all these restaurants that have all these different flavors of wings. Nothing is ever as good, I think, my personal opinion, as the wings that are made with Frank's Red Hot Sauce. Um, Yep, Frank's, you can put it on almost anything. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I've tried every other kind of sauce. I mean, two times in my life, I've gone, you know, like on a wild pursuit. Uh, once was for the best margarita I'd ever tasted. Took about a year of trying margaritas every Friday night with my then brother-in-law. We finally figured that out and I'll, tell you about the, the margarita recipe. I think I've mentioned it on the air once before. And the other thing was best sauce for buffalo wings. And I've tried every kind of sauce. I mean, I go to like sauce websites and have ordered like a six pack of sauces and nothing makes wings as good as Frank's. It's because the vinegar. Um, if it doesn't make you go ouch when you stick your nose over a bowl of steaming wings. Oh, the other thing is wash the wings if, they're, if you don't buy them pre-cut, cut them, throw away the tips, um, and then uh, pat them dry with a paper towel, and then take kosher salt, coarse kosher salt, and put it in the palm of your hand, and then take your other hand and go like this over the wings, and it kind of grinds up the coarse kosher salt a little bit, and then let that salt sit on the wings for 10 or 15 minutes before you throw them in the oil and you should use corn oil because it gets hotter than other oils. Um, you can use other oils, they won't be quite as good. I no longer deep fry my wings, I make them on the grill, then add the sauce. But that's the official recipe is dry them, or wash them, pat them dry, grind the salt, let it sit, let the salt absorb into the skin, that makes it crisp up better when you fry it. You don't coat it with anything before you throw it in uh, the deep fryer. Um, pull them out when they turn golden brown, let them cool down for like a minute or two, and then drizzle the sauce on them, put them like in a big stainless steel bowl, drizzle the sauce on. Um, oh, and you mix, if you're using the original Franks, you need to mix some margarine or butter with it. Um, you can kind of make it, you know, it's a suit to taste or taste to suit thing, um, depending on how, how spicy you like them. Drizzle the sauce on and then toss them and serve them and you will make friends wherever you go, I promise. <laughs> Music to motion, I'm guilty I've eaten of cloven hoof. <laughs> uh, do I bread them first? No, uh, you don't have to bread them first. The Anchor Bar in Buffalo, yep. Yeah, and you also need celery cut into pieces about that long, combined with um, uh, like blue cheese, you know, the watery kind of blue cheese with chunks floating in it. Um, and yeah, you take a couple bites of, of the, the wing, your mouth will be hot, and then you take a piece of celery, dip it in the blue cheese, and cram it in your mouth. Road Rally update. Do we have to talk about actual stuff? <laughs> <laughs> um, I really don't have an update, frankly. It, it's too soon to tell. Um, I can't remember what the date is, uh, but it's the first weekend in November. Um, and I just don't know at this point. We've got to see how, you know, how things go. I mean, things are starting to open up. And once things are pretty opened up um, and a good portion of the country has been vaccinated, that's when I'm going to do a survey and ask people, if we have an in-person road rally, will you actually come? And give me a real answer. Don't say, yeah, I think I'll come. I, I need to know because it's a major financial commitment and legal commitment on my part. And the planning is so different for the hotel version than the, than the online version. Um, 
I'm a little worried that November is not that far away and that people are going to say, I don't want to go through an airport. I don't want to fly in a plane, although they say you're better off in a plane than a grocery store. And I tend to believe that. Um, and then uh, when they get there, are they going to want to be in a ballroom with a thousand people? Um, and what rules will we have to follow if we're even able by law to have the road rally at that point? So there are a lot of like balls in the air on that. And I just don't know. Um, I know that we all look forward to the day where we can do an in-person road rally again. But imagine the bar, the lobby bar, you know, with four or 500 people drinking in there. It's like, you know, people at bars have to speak loudly to get their voices heard over the din of the room. And we've all wiped a little spittle from our eyes in a bar, right? So I don't know. Things are looking good now, especially with the Johnson Johnson vaccine. Yeah, but I heard it's only like 66%. Uh, thank you, Liz, for posting that November 6, 5, 6, and 7. I hear it's only 66% uh, effective. Talk about Ottawa radium. You mean radium as in the, there was a, was it West Clocks? where they had, uh, they made clocks and watches where they put radium on the, the hands of the clock so you could see it at night when it glowed. Is that what you're talking about? They're down to age 55 on COVID shots. That's good to know. Get a mobile bar, a BBQ company to park their trailer and grills out in front of the Westin LAX. Yeah, and then I would be um, breaching my contract with the hotel, unfortunately, because they are the, the, the hotel gives me the ballroom and the meeting rooms if enough sleeping rooms are booked and enough people eat at the luncheons. Like, I don't make money on those things, but what it does is offsets the cost of... Because if you just tried to rent that ballroom and the 10 classrooms we use upstairs, I couldn't afford that. Uh, certainly not at a convention that's free. Um, so that's how the deal we worked out is if we fill up, if we meet our quota of sleeping rooms and we hold those two luncheons and we don't make any money on the luncheons, but the hotel makes enough money that it offsets the cost of the other things. Chris Anderson has second shot last week. Yay. Yeah, I'm getting my first one March 13th or March 18th. I can't remember. Um, anyway, it's 5.03. We went overtime because we were talking about food, and that was actually a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Now I'm hungry. I am now going to have some blue corn chips, not deep fried, unsalted, very healthy, <laughs> uh, dipped in sour cream, with Frank's hot sauce drizzled on the sour cream. There you go. So I will see you guys on Monday. And don't forget, first of all, if you are not a subscriber to the channel after today's show, you may actually want to unsubscribe. Um, no, but if you've never seen one of these shows before, subscribe to our channel. Hit that red button down in the lower right-hand corner. Um, and also, give us a like. YouTube likes when we get liked. Uh, and Monday's show, I've got to double check, but I'm 99% sure, yes, we're going to play the top 10 songs from the website on Monday's show. Last time we did it, you guys really enjoyed it, so we're going to give you another fun show on Monday. We will see you right back here, 4 o'clock, same time, same station. Bye, you guys. Have a great night. Thanks for hanging out. It was fun. Oh, shoot, I forgot. Thursday. Hold on. I forgot. It's not Thursday. Today is Tuesday. I've lost track of time. We will be here on Thursday. Thursday, right here. Um, I don't know what we're going to talk about. Oh, remind me to tell you about uh, how to make the perfect margarita on Thursday. All right. See you here Thursday, four o'clock. Bye, you guys. Bye.